Well, good morning, City Light. We're awake now. Okay, it's, I know it's been jury this weekend, but good morning. All right, there we go. Some of y'all here. That's fine. My name is Mo. Uh, I am one of the pastors here. I'm actually really grateful to be here uh, this morning, uh, and I'm excited to go back into our faith series uh, in Hebrews 11. So if you have a Bible, please open it up to Hebrews 11. Uh, we started this a few weeks ago, and uh, man, we had Ricky speaking last night, last week on faith, right? Like he talked about our response in faith, the, the, the object of our faith, and then the focus of our faith, like walking through the story of Abraham. And so th- today we're going to actually continue with some of that, but, but remember his final point last week? His final point was amazing, right? Like he, he talked about the airport and our faith being somewhat like an airport. Like we're sitting there, we're, we're trying to make our way to the terminal and get on our flight to go where our actual destination is. But some of us treat our faith like an airport in the fact that like we like to make the airport as comfortable as possible. And so we paint the walls, we, we set up nice comfy chairs and seats for ourselves, we get all the amenities as possible so that as we sit and wait, it's as comfortable as possible, and all the while we have a problem because we're decorating an airport. Right, It's still an airport. It's not the goal. It's not where we're going. And so it's a waste of time and energy and money. But we're, we're ultimately missing out on where is our flight and where are we headed? How are we preparing ourselves for that flight? And so the focus of our faith and trajectory is based on a promise and not based on the place that we're sitting now. And every day we're moving toward that destination that Jesus would have for us. And so what does it look like to have faith in the midst of that? Well, as we continue this morning into our text, we're going to have the author show us what faith looks like that Jesus intended for us and how that plays out. How is that practiced? And so when we look at that, we're going to figure out what it looks like to stop decorating an airport uh, and what it looks like to exercise that faith and also see that faith get passed on. And so today we'll be in Hebrews 11, chapter 11, verses 17 through 22. And so what we're going to actually, we're going to look at some more of Abraham and his faith and kind of the, the culmination of his faith as seen in Scripture and, and how that faith is practiced by him, but then also how it's, it's passed on as well. So let's take a look at faith in practice. Hebrews 7, uh, 11, verse 17. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it is said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. And so this is faith in practice. Now, the author of Hebrews, he's pointing out like the most pivotal moment in Abraham's journey when it comes to faith. And really what he's pointing to is Genesis 22. In Genesis 22, God comes to Abraham and he says, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. But how do we get here though, right? Like, how do we get to, man, this is the son of the promised, I'm going to make you a blessing of all nations, and then go kill your son, right? Like, that's, that's the movement there. So there had to be a story to go with that, but if you remember back from last week, Ricky shared exactly what happened with Abraham and Isaac, or uh, sorry, Abraham and Sarah, his wife, right? So God comes to them in their old age when they're not typically able to have kids and says, hey, you're going to have a baby. You remember what their response was? They laughed at God, right? Like they chuckled. They were like, yeah, that's, that's, that's cool. But no, God, that's not gonna, what's going to happen. And then God, being funny the way he is, gives them a baby, Isaac, which literally means he laughs. So God is like, here's a baby. I'm laughing at you right now, right? Like that's, that's how that took place. And, and remember, basically this was different steps of faith for them, right? Seeing God reveal himself, seeing God fulfill his promises, but then they're, they're just on this journey with God one step after another, seeing their faith lived out practice, but it was, it was one they stumbled through, right? Like, but it was the process of building those faith muscles. So they didn't just arrive at a place, but it was, it was a journey for them. And so as we look at Abraham's faith, even the faith of, of the other people in Hebrews 11, what we'll find is that, that while they stumbled through it, they, they didn't see this faith realized in its completion in one moment, right? It, it was a journey for them. They didn't just spontaneously have this great, huge faith. It was something that was built up, much like our muscles, right? So, so see, faith is not something that you muster up in one moment to succeed in one space, but it's actually a journey of working out your faith as you build the muscles of faith and see God do that for you. 
Does that make sense? That God would come in and be the one that, that builds your faith as you're practicing your faith in this faith journey. And so that, that's what we're looking at. And, and, I know, and I know some of us might not be in the faith gym as much as we'd like to be, right? Like that's the case. But, but God is still wanting to pursue you in that and still work out your faith. And, and that's, that's how we get to see God do miraculous, glorious things in our midst, right? Like we get to see his glory shine as we're working out our faith, as we're practicing our faith. And God had displayed those things to Abraham, and he showed him a promise and his plan. And he showed him that, hey, man, when I tell you something, it's going to happen. That's, that's what he displayed in Isaac, that God's plan will not be stopped. No matter what our circumstances, no matter what we're facing in the midst of it, his plan won't be stopped. So track with me here. God told Abraham to take his one and only son whom he loves and kill him. And not only kill him, he said make him a burnt sacrifice. So make him like an animal being sacrificed. You know, the son that he promised would help him be a blessing to all nations, to have a nation of his own. That very son, God has said, hey, sacrifice him. And according to our text, if you look at it, the way Abraham responded to that is as if, Isaac was already sacrificed. It was a done deal in his mind. Once he heard from the Lord, he said, okay, let's go. That's a, that's a huge step of faith. That's a huge sacrifice. It wasn't this thing of like, well, are you sure, God? Maybe this isn't the best idea to kill my kid. But instead, it's as if it's already accomplished. That's how much faith muscle had been built up in this man at this point. And so what he did is he took his boy Isaac and, his, and some of his servants, and he went to Mount Moriah. Now, I don't want us to miss the depth of the sacrifice and the testing of Abraham's faith here. You see, he was promised a huge promise, right? That I'm going to make you a nation that's a blessing to other nations. And then God tells him to kill the very seed that was supposed to be planted in order to be that nation. And it was his son who was precious to him, right? His sons, it says the son whom you love, right? So that means he, was, he had a deep affection for him. So, so let's, let's put ourselves in his shoes for a second, okay? So I have two sons, but let's just say, for instance, he tells me to sacrifice my youngest son, Uriah. Now, that's my boy right there. Yeah, he, he's got some swag. He's got some swag. It's like he's, he, he's pretty confident in the way he dresses and looks. He's actually wearing that hat today. Look at that dude. It's crazy. So that's my boy. That's my boy Uriah. That's my little Rye guy. He is precious to me. Now God says, Mo, go and sacrifice Uriah. And so I take my boy and we walk over to Holmes Lake where there's a hill at least. And we get to the foot of the hill and Uriah looks to me and says, Dad, where's the lamb to be sacrificed? And I look at Uriah, and I say, Uriah, the, the lamb will be provided. And so then we get up to the top of the hill, and we build an altar, and I get my rope out, and I start to tie my boy up. And as I'm tying my boy up, tears start to fall down his eye because he just realized that he's the one that's being sacrificed, right? And so then I lift him up, and I put him on the altar, and as, as those tears are falling, he's no doubt at this point screaming in terror because he realizes what's happening. And then I pull my knife up, and he becomes more frantic and more frantic and more frantic as I lift my knife into the air. This was the ultimate testing of Abraham's faith. He was told by God to sacrifice what was precious, precious to him. And this was significant because according to verse 18, he said that Isaac would be the fulfillment of God's promise. So at this point, it seems like God's going back on his word. That's the son that he's supposed to plunge his knife into, his little precious boy called out by God to obey God in sacrificing his son. And, and I say all of that because practicing faith, if we're doing it well, if we're walking in faith, it will be attested. It will be tested and it will be a sacrifice. It will require us to be uncomfortable. Like, like while we have eternal hope, right, like we all look to it, we say we have eternal hope and there's a promise that will be a future revelation of that. But faith is not sitting on our hands and waiting for that hope, by the way. Faith is being the hands of Jesus, walking in faith-filled obedience to God even when it hurts and leaving the results up to him. You see, this journey may lead us to sacrifice something or someone very special to us. 
Not to maybe tie them up and stab them, obviously, but there is a sense of we have to let them go and let God lead them. Let them go and see God come through for them or even allowing them to miss out on something for the sake of obeying God. We have some friends and family here in our church, Joshua and Deanna Dreer. And they might be called out to a place in western Kentucky. And this, this place isn't as stable as, say, a Lincoln. Uh, it's, it has less to provide for a family. It's less developed in, than the city of Lincoln. And, and one of the things that they don't have opportunities for is dance. Okay? And, and, and so that's kind of a hard thing for them as a family because they have a daughter who is good at ballet. Uh, she loves ballet. She dreams about la- ballet. She has a future aspiration to do it professionally someday. And when they were sitting down with her like godly parents ought to and say, hey, we might be taking a huge step of faith. And here's what that might require. We, there, there might not be dance there. And so as they're having, as Deanna is having this conversation with Whoa. <laughs> Uh-oh. Uh, as Deanna's having this conversation with her daughter, um, her daughter asks a very profound question. She asked the right question is what I would argue. She asked, would there be dance, would there be ballet in heaven? Now, Deanna doesn't know the answer to that. She's never been there. But nonetheless, what we can conjure up from Scripture is that God created the arts. He made it for our good, enjoyable pleasure. And maybe, just maybe, most likely, ballet will probably be there because it's a beautiful thing. And so her daughter says this. Catch this. Then I can give up ballet now because I can be doing it forever with Jesus. That's faith, boys and girls. That, that's faith right there. This little girl, when her faith was tested, like Abraham, remembered the promise. She remembered the promise that she gets to be with Jesus for all eternity. So the current circumstance, the current thing that she's going through or the thing that she might have to give up, she's going to get someone far better, Jesus. He's greater than ballet. He's greater than our kids, greater than our relationships, greater than our marriages, greater than our homes that we might have, greater than the finances that we might be able to hold to all into. He is better than anything we can possibly possess here on earth. And so City Light, let me ask you, who or what is precious to you? Like, who are they? What is that thing or that person that you hold so dear that if you were to lose them, it would tear your soul apart? If you lost them, who is that person or that thing that would just wreck you? See, the practice of faith is being willing to open our hands to giving up that person or that thing. Practicing faith requires sacrifice. So so practically speaking... It may mean sacrificing some of your kid's sports career to see your, yourself and your family faithfully walk with a body, with a church on mission. It might mean that. It might mean ending that toxic relationship that you're in that continues to draw you away from the love of Christ and not toward it. It might mean that you have a few less Starbucks during the week so that you can be generous elsewhere. And it might also mean giving up the comfort of having your own home to yourself and your family to invite in a foster kid to love, train, and lead. It might mean giving up some of your finances to your local body of Christ so much so that it's uncomfortable just so that you might see Christ continue to reign in someone else's life. It might mean giving up some of your relationships here at South to go with the North Church plant, because you'll see them later, right? Like, it, it means uncomfortable, right? Like, if it isn't uncomfortable, if it isn't sacrificial, if it isn't maybe even hurting a bit, I would argue that you're probably not practicing faith. You see, we have to keep an open hand to the people and the things in our life so that we might see Jesus do a miraculous thing. There's a greater joy to be had with the friends that you have in the room, right? Like the greater joy is being with Christ later. It's greater than what you have right now. It's greater than the thing that you might have to give up or sacrifice. And catch this. If you're giving up relationships in the room to see the mission of God go forward elsewhere, guess what? You'll be with the people in the room no matter how or, or joyful they are for the rest of eternity. It's great, right? Like we get that. That's an added bonus to that. And so we can give what is 
what we have earthly so that we can see what eternity might bring here, right? And saying yes to obeying God in faith, it means that his glory will be displayed and some people might actually get saved through the process. So I don't know what God might be calling you to sacrifice or, or, or to do in practicing your faith so that you might see his miraculous works. But the real question for us today, though, is will you trust him with that person or that thing? Will you trust him with it? See, like Abraham, our faith will be tested. It will be. It's a, it's a given. If we're practicing, if we're walking in faith, it's going to be tested. And like Abraham, when it happens, the thing we must cling to is not the things we hold dearly, but the promises of God that he will see it through. That's what we cling to. Look at this in verse 19. It starts out by saying, he considered that God was able. You see, that word considered there is that he had this deeply, deeply rooted conviction of something. And for him is that God would fulfill his plan regardless of what the present circumstances is. So think about it. Abraham had never even seen a resurrection, but it says he thought maybe he resurrected his son. Like, it had never even happened yet. And he's like, you know what? I serve a God that can do impossible. He's able even to resurrect my son, even though I didn't see, has, have never heard or seen that happen. He had a deeply rooted conviction that his God was able and one thing that I think is so important for us to catch in, in this is that the value of your faith is, is not the magnitude, and it's not measured by the magnitude of your belief either. The value of your faith is measured by the object of your faith, Jesus Christ himself. So here's what I mean by that. This is a very scary moment for Abraham, right? Like, think about it. He's a murderer <laughs> if his faith isn't in the right God. Right? He goes down in history as the crazy man who killed his son in the name of a false god. That's who he becomes if it's not in the right God. You see, Abraham considered that God was able. This, this doesn't mean that he wasn't disappointed. It doesn't mean that he wasn't scared and didn't feel a deep sense of sadness for the future death of his son. You see, I'm, I'm, I am sure that Abraham, as he was walking in this, did not have a cold, calculated decision to be made by which he just explained it away with Christian platitudes. That's not how he walked into the situation. This was his boy. But faith, knowing and trusting what is true, doesn't remove the burden of how we feel about the circumstance. No, what it does, it simply helps us not lose hope or spiral out of control because we know that we can press on with Jesus. You see, in the midst of it, he's going to be with us. That's what it does. That's what faith does. It doesn't remove the feeling or the burden necessarily that you have in your heart for whatever that decision or that sacrifice might be, but it holds you steady in the midst of it. And so as Abraham was just about to plunge his knife into his son, God does a miraculous thing. He abruptly stops him. He doesn't kill his kid. In Genesis 22, 12, and 13, God says, Do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. You see, Abraham had faith that God would provide a lamb, whether that be the ram in the thicket or his own son. Abraham knew that God was good and believed that he would do what he said he would do. That he believed that God could do the impossible. He believed that he was, he was able. And, and here's the beauty of that. This opportunity of faith filled sacrifice for Abraham was actually alluding to something much more beautiful. It was, it was alluding to the actual sacrificial lamb that Abraham and we both need, and that's Jesus Christ himself. You see that? The only difference is, is that God did sacrifice his son. He did not withhold the sacrifice. The nails were plunged into his hands. He was he burnt up our sin on the cross, so to speak, through his body and blood, and he did, in fact, die. But catch this. Abraham was right. He was able. Because Jesus did, three days later, resurrect from the grave, showing victory over Satan, sin, and death. And here's what happened. God showed not man's faithfulness to him, but God's faithfulness to see his promise through. That's what he showed in the resurrection. So imagine it. The pain of sacrificing my own son, the pain and discomfort of doing that, picture that. But here's the scandal of it all. 
God did just that. He sacrificed his son, his only son. He didn't, he didn't pull back from him. He didn't hold back death from him. No, no. He gave his only son not for good moral people who behave, but for the sinful people that we are, whether we use religion as our platform to do our moral things or if we do licentiousness and decide to go into our depravity. Both are equally sinful, and he died for those things so that we might have life in his son who perfectly lived, who perfectly loved and perfectly was a sacrifice for us. So to give us perspective, a, a philosopher, uh, Miguel de Anima, Anumanu, you can look it up later, those who believe that they believe in God, but without passion in their hearts, without anguish in mind, without uncertainty, without doubt, without an element of despair, even in their consolation, believe only in the God idea, not in God himself. You see, our faith is practiced through a real God. He is real, and a, and a God who is able to do far more than we could ever imagine. And that faith doesn't just end with us making a decision or end with us in general, but it is something that must be passed on. It will be passed on. And so look with me in, in the last few verses there, verse 20. By faith, Isaac invoked future blessing on Jacob and Esau. By faith, Jacob, when dying, blessed each of his sons, each of the sons of Joseph, bowing in worship over the head of his staff. By faith, Joseph, at the end of his life, made mention of the exodus of the Israelites and gave directions concerning his bones. So we're now looking at faith passed on. So you have Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, which is Abraham's son, grandson, and great-grandson. And as you watch these men in their lives in the book of Genesis, you see them go on their faith journey imperfectly, but still sharing that same faith of the promise that Abraham got, that he will have a blessed people that are going to be a blessing to other nations. And so let's start with Isaac. Isaac's faith, it says, by faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau in regard to their future. So in Genesis 27, Isaac was, was old and blind, and so his son, uh, Jacob, comes up to him in effort to steal the blessing from his older brother Esau, dressed like Esau, okay? So he, ch he walks in, and he comes in and bamboozles his dad with his mama's help, so that's really dysfunctional, right? And takes his brother's blessing. So side note real quick for you the folks that are in the room. The Bible is full of completely dysfunctional families. So the message of that is... He can work through yours, okay? Everybody's got dysfunctional families. He's got an ideal family, no doubt about it, but most people have dysfunctional. That's just the way it is. Anyway, after the blessing was given to Jacob, uh, Isaac had faith that though it was given to the improper person, that God would still see it through. He would still see his plan through with full knowledge that this is not the way it was supposed to happen. And see, this matters, right? Because Isaac wasn't afraid to see what God would do, right? Like he, he knew that he, he put the blessing in the wrong place, but he knew that God's plan would still be sought through even though man tried to corrupt it, right? You see, he might have been a blind man, but his faith wasn't blind. He knew God would accomplish what he said he would accomplish. And then we got Jacob. Jacob's faith. Next, it says, by faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of Joseph's sons and worshiped as he leaned on top of his staff. You see, Jacob in his old age with his son had his son Joseph bring his grandsons to him. He had one stand on his left, Manasseh, and then he had Ephraim stay on his, stand on his left. And the reason why is because you're supposed to give the blessing to the oldest one first, and then the, the younger one gets the lesser of the blessings. But catch this. God spoke to Jacob in Genesis 48 and said, no, give it to Ephraim. And so what he does, he crosses his arms and delivers the blessing to Ephraim first and then Manasseh. Now catch this, the standard way of operating is that you would give the blessing, remember, to the firstborn. That's the way everyone would do it at that time, and flying in the face of what normal cultural behavior would be, he heard from God and he obeyed. Remember, that's the dude that stole the blessing from his older brother, right? Like, that's, that's the faith that he built over time. And so this man, after years of exercising, after years of practicing his faith, he heard God, believed God, and responded, even though it was contrary to earthly convictions. It was different than everyone else would have done that. You see, as you watch Jacob, while his faith is practiced imperfectly, we're all in process, right? Like, we're all in process. None of us walk by faith perfectly, but the end game is that he ended well. He ended well. And it's, in, it's significant to note that Jacob, it says that he worshiped on his staff. 
So he leaned over on the staff. You see, in Genesis 32, Jacob literally wrestled with God, it says. He, he, he physically wrestled with God, and of course, God won, right? Like, it's obvious. God is God. But, and through that process, God popped his hip out of place so that the rest of his life, dude, walked with a limp. So this is significant. Here's the thing. When he was out on the journey before he was wrestling with God, he was seeking his brother Esau's approval. See, he saw, he saw that he was, he was wrong in stealing his blessing, so he was looking for his approval. But what he found instead was the actual approval that he needed, God's. You see, it says in that text that he walked away delivered. He walked away from wrestling with God delivered. And so many of us, many of us in the room, maybe you're wrestling with God as well. Maybe you're wrestling with the truthfulness and the sustainability of faith in Christ and the gospel. Can, can I press in just for a moment with you? It's a worthy wrestle. You, you should wrestle with God. Count the cost and meet with God face to face like Jacob did. And Jacob spent the rest of his life, though he lost the fight in that way, he spent the rest of his life joyfully limping because he encountered the living God. And so not because he wrestled with God, but because he was delivered by God. He had a true encounter with God. And so that's, that's a, a worthy wrestle, and I would call you to wrestle with God in that. Because here's what happens. When you place your faith in that Jesus, the one that died for you, you're probably going to walk with a limp for the rest of your life in a good way. That means that he will consume your life to the, where you're, to, to the point where your trajectory will be different for all of eternity you see, God is inviting us to wrestle with him. I can't promise that it's going to be easy or it's going to work out perfect, but I can promise that it will be for your good. That's why Jacob was worshiping God on this cane. He was remembering when he popped his hip out of place and allowed him to be delivered by him. It's a beautiful thing. Now, Joseph's faith. The last Jewish patriarch mentioned here is Joseph. See, he, 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 he knew nothing would get in the way of God's plan. Like, if you watch Joseph's story throughout the entire book of Genesis, the, the guy is just profound in his faith. Uh, it says, by faith, Joseph, when his end was near, spoke about the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt and gave instructions about his bones. You see, what happened to Joseph is he was betrayed by his brothers and sent to be basically left for dead and then sold into slavery. It's a great story. I would actually strongly encourage you, if you have time this week, go back, read Genesis 37 to 50. It's one of the best stories told in Scripture, outside of Christ, obviously. Uh, but anyway, in that moment, that's where his story, like it's a great story of faith, and what you get to see through that is the beautiful God of the universe come through over and over and over again despite the circumstances. And so the best part of it all, though, is that he rescues and restores Joseph constantly throughout it, and at his deathbed, so Joseph's about to die. It's as if death isn't the greatest thing in his mind in the moment. Like, it's, it's when his faith is most tested at his deathbed, Genesis 50, he acts as though death is just a part of the journey, and he moves on to more important things. Here's what he says. And then he gives instruction as, as a proof uh, to, to, to this very thing. He says, I am about to die, but God will visit you and bring you up out of the land, this land to the land that he has sworn to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones from here. You see that? He said, I'm about to die, but here's the really important thing. That, that's, what that, that's what kind of faith this man had in his life. Catch this. Joseph was with his family until he was 17 years old. They turned their back on him, sold him into slavery. He spent the next years of his life till he was 110 years old in Egypt. And guess what his faith said? God has promised to free you from Egypt. So when that happens, after my death, take my bones up out of here. And, and guess what? It happened. Right? Like his, his faith was fulfilled. You see that in Exodus 13, 19, when they later on, they are exiting out of Egypt, and they remember to take his mummy with them, and then they eventually bury him in Shechem in the promised land that God had promised them. You see, his faith was passed on. Th these guys were faith-filled people. And some of these people surely weren't perfect, right? Like, we saw what Jacob did. We've seen what Abraham has done as well. They weren't perfect, but yet you see them be faithful to the end. And so you see faith more. It's more than just something that we possess. 
Faith is something that's given to us, something that's practiced as we build up the muscles, and it'll be tested, and it'll, it'll be worked out as we continue in this journey. From sacrificing relationships to, to our kids. It, it will take us from wrestling God to being in uncomfortable circumstances where we sacrifice things that we love and enjoy. Faith will give you life and help you see the beauty of the end like Joseph. See, like the most important takeaway of practicing and passing on our faith is this. It is through faith that we get to see more, get more, and experience more of God. That's what practicing faith gets us. We get to see more, experience more, and come alongside God and seeing what he's going to do. And so the challenge for us today, here's, here's the questions I want you guys to ask yourselves. Do you trust God with your whole life or just part of it? And the second one is, are you progressively opening up your hands to the obedience of faith in Jesus Christ? You see, would we be a people not not just place our faith in God for salvation, but that we would continue that by placing our faith in Jesus for our entire life? Not just a moment in a decision, but for every single aspect of your life. Amen? Let's pray.